Take it from here and use it for your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. What? Different kind of service. Amen. It's like finding a way to maybe put the defibrillator paddles to us and then bringing it right back down to a place to, to understand, boy, finding a way to live in the presence of the Lord, that's huge. Amen? I just have to tell you, for me, that particular song is a very emotional one. I handpicked that particular song uh, for somebody's funeral. And the reason I'm going to even touch on that just to get us started here is for you to hear something really powerful. Is, you know, this individual that struggled with addiction for many, many years and loved the Lord but just kept going back to the same trap, the same trap. Um, found a way to live in the presence of the Lord finally with the last breath that she took. Because God is gracious. But let me just tell you something. What she didn't know is there's a way to live in the presence of the Lord here and now. Amen? For her, it was a defeat. Crushing. But that particular song ministered deeply to my heart. Because we worked diligently to show her the freedom in Christ. She couldn't hear it. She couldn't hear it over the voices of others who had a better plan. Right? And so, uh, crazy note to start out on, but I just have to say I heard Brother Dave's heart as somebody, we met with somebody today. And, and listening to the guy, I had to turn to him at, at one point and just say, Stop! You don't have much time left. You need to listen right now. It got real serious real quick. And the reason I said that is, you know, we've been around the block a time or two. We know what it is to walk in the freedom that the Lord has given us, the power that is there to a surrendered life. But we're our own worst enemies. Amen. I'm going to go somewhere cool with this tonight, so okay? But I just had to get you from this place and, and try to get on board because there's a message here to receive that's powerful. And, and we can embrace it and we can allow the Lord to do amazing things in our life, but we, gotta, we really got to get our mind wrapped around that God has the answers. He's equipped us and we can step into that identity. We can live it. But we can't do it half-witted or nit-witted, as I like to say. I'm going to be in Hebrews chapter 6 to get started, verse 16 and following. So some people swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what he had promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that two, by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have fled to take hold of the hope set before us. We may be greatly encouraged. We may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope, listen, as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. It enters into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become our high priest forever in order of Melchizedek. You know, for us to get our mind wrapped around this, an anchor for our soul. I'm going to come down on the floor with you for a minute. An anchor for our soul. Out of everything that happens, everything that we deal with, in the day-to-day -day life, living in the presence of our Lord, all the circumstances that surround us, everything, we find hope in this reality that Jesus, 
Jesus entered in behind the curtain, as in the temple, the veil, the curtain, that, you know, that they would have a priest that would enter in, and if there was sin in his life, they have a rope tied to him, and they would drag him out deceased. And another one would have to go, that the only one qualified to go there without a rope was Jesus. Amen? And that reality is that He paid the penalty of our sin. The reality of the victory that gave us the anchor for our soul. You hear what I'm saying? Immovable. Jesus. That anchor changes who we are. Do you hear me? It changes who we are. Then you realize something. As my dear friend that we ministered to didn't get it. It wasn't on her merit that she had to be in the presence of the Lord. It was on His. And so we, we can be victorious. We can stand in the power of the Almighty if we understand that reality. We have an anchor for our soul. Amen? Amen? Amen. If you don't understand that, everything else changes. We, it's like... It's like having a wishy-washy mentality of things. Jesus secured it. Amen? Immovable, unchangeable anchor for your soul. So, Saul, Saul had to have an encounter with Jesus. We see that in the 26th chapter of Acts. And he gives, we see the testimony of that in the 26th chapter of Acts. And, and I want to go somewhere tonight with this in mind. We have an anchor for our soul. Amen? Amen? All right. We have an anchor for our soul. And we need to understand that reality so that we can begin to live in a way that's reflective of that. Doesn't mean that we don't have to take off a lot of things and put on a lot of things per the instruction of God Almighty. But it means that our our identity in Christ, our eternity is secure by an anchor that's unchangeable and unmovable. Amen? Acts chapter 26 uh, is this testimony that the Apostle Paul is in a trial and he's given uh, this, his testimony before King Agrippa. And he's, he's laying it out, he's telling this, Hey, you know, he's get laying it out in layman's terms. A highly educated guy's giving it in layman's terms that says, Hey, listen, you know, I'm just giving testimony. Do you not believe the prophets who foretold about the Messiah? Because this Jesus hits him. Amen? And so he's laying it out there with great conviction. Why? Because he met the anchor to his soul. Amen? And so he has this powerful powerful testimony unchangeable immovable paul knew he knew on the road to damascus that he described when he said the everything before this king and a plead before him not in his own defense but a testimony about the one who rescued him amen he had something there that gave him that boldness and you know what it was an anchor to his soul amen an anchor to his soul. So the power in that, the reality of that, we see in Acts 26, verse 32, it says, Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if, had, if he had not appealed to Caesar. And which brings us to Acts chapter 27. Brings us to Acts chapter 27. And it gets really hairy from here. Because you know what's so crazy about a boldness that comes from who we are in Christ? We don't, we don't you know, whimper around trying to accomplish little trivial things anymore. Suddenly it's not about how do I get out of this the easiest way anymore. Suddenly it's about I want to accomplish every opportunity there is to be a testimony for the Lord Jesus. Amen? So not an arrogance doesn't arise in you. A boldness arises in you. Do you hear what I'm saying? There's quite a bit of difference between arrogance and boldness. Arrogance is somebody you don't want to be around. Amen? What Boldness is something that you're attracted to. 
Do you hear me? Boldness in the face of adversity is somebody you're attracted to. Why? Where is that boldness coming from? And when you start to examine the motives and you find out there is nothing for that individual to, to accomplish that betters their situation. In fact, perhaps it makes their situation worse, but they still have a boldness. Now I'm intrigued. Amen? It must be a powerful message that you want to proclaim. There's something behind it, right? You have to bear with my eyes. I've got a glare on here tonight. We're going to go with it. Amen? Amen. Some of it's tears, I think. Acts 27. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some of the other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship for Adram Yetium, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia. We had put out to sea Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day, we landed in Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. From there, we put out to sea again and passed to Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. We had sailed across the open sea of the coast of Caesarea and Pamphylia. We landed at Marta and Lesia. There was a centurion found there, Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy, and they put us aboard. We made slow headway for days and had difficulty arriving off Sidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Cyprus opposite Solomon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fairhaven, near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous, because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them. Now listen to this. Here's the man of God going to speak. Amen? This is the guy that was speaking before the king, and he could have been released, However, because he has to be before Caesar, he's on another mission. He's on a ship. He's going to go to bear testimony there. And so here's the man of God going to speak. He says this, men, I can see our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to our own lives also. Now here's the, here's the, the guys with the brains, okay? But the centurion... In, but the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on. Hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there, this was the harbor in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, the wind, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeastern swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so they gave way, and, it, and, it were, and they were driven along. As we passed to, the, to Lee, a small island, called Claudia, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Can you imagine what you're dealing with here? This is crazy, crazy stuff. Because they were afraid that it would run aground on the sandbars of Citrus. They lowered the sea anchor and they let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm 
that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Can you imagine how desperate this is getting crazy? When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Can you imagine that picture right there? So far where we're at? I'm going to tell you what, I'm not a fan of turbulent waters. I'm not a fan of them at all. I can't imagine what it would be to be on a vessel that you're throwing ropes from one side to the other underneath to hold the wood together for fear it's going to come apart. This is going on. They're battered. Of course, they didn't listen to the man of God that said, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you right now, this is disastrous. It's disastrous. They don't want to listen to him. We're going to listen to the pilot and the guy who owns it. Certainly they know, right? So they're doing these things, and they come to the place that they gave up all hope of being saved. And listen to this. Verse 21 says, After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God and to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. There's that trial. Amen? We're afraid to go to the trial. You're going to get put on a boat and we're, we're trembling in our, our boots, right? Because we've got to go stand before another trial and... The reality of it is, he's going there, storm, hurricane, or not. Amen? Do not be afraid. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took some sound soundings from, and found that the water was about 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found that it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that they would, they would dash against the rocks, they dropped four anchors and from the stern and prayed for daylight. Boy, you ever been there praying for daylight? Amen. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboats down into the sea, pretending that they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurions and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes and held the life, that held the lifeboats and let them drift away. Isn't it amazing? Now they're starting to listen to the man of God. Amen? Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You, have eaten, you haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive not one of you will, will lose a single hair from your head. After he said this, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God in front of all of them. Then he broke it and he began to eat. They were encouraged and they ate some food for themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw that a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. 
cutting loose the anchor. They left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. And they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made their way for the beach. But the ship struck the sandbar and ran aground, and the bow struck fast and, and would not move, and the stern was broken into pieces by the pounding of the surf, and the soldiers, the soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and keep them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first, and get to land, and the rest were to get on their planks and pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. I think about Paul and his level-headedness, and I I love the Apostle Paul. talk about Paul a lot because there's a lot of messages to find, you know, freedom for our lives. We can hear... In this particular story, if you could imagine what happens to each one of us so many times when crazy stuff like that happens in our life. If you imagine giving a testimony for the Lord and you think that, you know, I should have some sort of favor follow me. In reality, what you're going to hear is that you're going to be on, you know, this horrific journey. And there's going to be all sorts of things that threaten your very life. You're going to have people who want to lean on their own understanding around you that are going to be, they're going to be, they have authority to make decisions around you. And you're going to have to be the level-headed one because what God is going to do is vindicate you in their eyes when the very things that come from your mouth that are being directed by his guiding hand come to pass right before their eyes. So in the midst of everything that's happening, it's a crazy story. It's a powerful story. But I always look to the characters. I think about the ship's owner and the pilot. Two wise guys. Amen? Hey, let's just, we're just going, you know what? The pilot says we're cool and the ship owner, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going with him, yeah. Never mind the man of God. And how about... When you think about Paul, hears that and he knows, okay, that decision I'm going to live through. But he also knows something else. He also knows that those people on that boat are going to benefit that the man of God is with him. Are you hearing me? Because he's not going to die. Because he's going to stand trial. And the truth of it is, that we have opportunity if we can get our minds wrapped around this message that we started with. You know, the anchor of our soul. In this story that you heard Paul dealing with this hellish storm and hurricane uh, winds and all these things are going on, they tried to drop anchor to find, you know, stability at some point. But Jesus is the unmovable anchor for our soul. Amen? In this case... The anchors they were trying to do was trying to create some sort of stability. Well, they still underwent this hellish assault. Amen? We hear the story. We see Paul's unwavering faith as he presses through. And then God comes through. I can't imagine what Paul was doing, you know, in his private time on this ship as he's moving along. You know, we have days on end of a battering storm. You think that storm was anything by accident? No. The wind's at the hand of the Almighty. Amen? But Paul's on there. In his character, his mission, everything he's about is to proclaim the gospel message. Amen? Have you ever considered that our mission is to proclaim the gospel message? Have you ever considered that understanding the anchor for your soul is required to accomplish that mission? Have you ever considered that being on that ship wasn't an accident, it wasn't a misfortune, it was a by design ordained by God appointment? 
and that the things that were unfolding before him, he found no concern in his heart at all other than to keep this communion with God. You know what's so amazing? You know what's so amazing? If you read what he did when he broke bread on this vessel, you know what he did? It sounds like the description that we have in the New Testament of the Lord's Supper. He broke the bread and he gave thanks to God. Amen? In the midst of this crazy mess. Right? And these guys are tripping. You understand? Now listen. In the process of everything that happened, the ship owner, you lost everything. You know, the tackle, everything that's getting thrown out, that's, that's done. They eat, and now they're throwing off the rest of the stuff off. They're just, they're just going for their lives now. You hear what I'm saying? They, they've come to reality that this guy was correct, and we're just going to go with, just get the stuff overboard, right? My point for us to really try to consider is that, you know, on our journeys that we have, just maybe, just maybe you're going to have an encounter with somebody as Paul did with everybody aboard that boat. Maybe you're going to have an opportunity to speak prophetically something that the Lord gives you a word. And I'm not talking nonsense, garbage, that you hear on television all the time. I'm talking about in the movement of the work of God, when God gives you a word that's about accomplishing His very purpose, the reason you're on planet Earth, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, you have a word that speaks into somebody's life, like I believe I had today when I told this man today, you don't have much time on this planet. That's, that's powerful stuff to say. I told him the last time that I said that to somebody who said what he said, they're deceased. Now, when I tell you that, that's just to say, can you imagine what it is to walk in the power of knowing, as Paul did, he knew that he was the God-man that God himself ordained to bring a message to the Gentiles. He knew that mission was something that was very serious. He turned his whole life to that mission. And because of it, the character we see is an amazing an amazing character. So when we consider the things that go on in our life, we're like, well, I can't even imagine, you know, having to stand trial and getting put on, you know, this, this crazy kind of a vessel and, you know, there's liability for all that, you know, somebody should take better care of us and everything. You know, listen, everything that happens in our life, I don't care what it is in the day that we live in, in the craziness of the society we live in where we feel like we're entitled to everything, and that there's liability that everybody has if they be wrong, if they do something wrong to us, we'll call our attorney or whatever. Listen, we're supposed to be salt and light. And God wants to use the craziest of circumstances of people's lives that are sold out to him to accomplish purposes that are far greater than anything we could ever imagine. And when you see the steadfast character of something that Paul says, you know, uh, an angel of the God I serve, of whom I serve, came to me and said that not one of us will die, not a hair on your head will be damaged, but the ship will be a total loss. He spoke that out of his mouth, and he said, I am certain that what happened, what he said, that's going to happen. It's going to happen. And so now when you think about that their lives were spared at the end, because you heard what the plan was, they wanted to kill them so nobody could get away. What do you think? changed the minds there about that little dilemma. Do you think maybe, do you think maybe the authorities on board started thinking about the prophetic word that, he, that they heard? We shouldn't sail because this is going to be, this is going to be devastating. It's going to do these things. It's even going to take our lives, he started out with, and then until an angel of God came and said that isn't going to happen. We're going to spare yours and, the, and everybody on here's life. However, they got to stay aboard. they got to stay aboard. So when he's speaking, he says, and the guards here, you know, they're lowering these boats down, they're ready to skate. And he says, hey, listen, by the way, if these guys get off, you can't be saved. Swords are going. Ropes are getting cut. Suddenly, the words of this guy have some power. 
And so what do you think God has going on in our lives today, maybe, that he wants to authenticate the words coming out of your, lo- out of your mouth with power? What do you think maybe in some of the circumstances that are going on, he wants to do something amazing if we'll get our eyes off of ourselves and let's just turn them right back to the anchor of our soul? Yeah? Turn it right back to the anchor for our soul, Jesus. Immovable. Get our minds wrapped around a message that says this temporal life that we try to live and we try to do it our way again and again and again, that's garbage. I want to get to the place to be so driven like Paul was. Can you imagine Saul before he met Jesus? He was killing Christians. The, the, The scripture says that he was excited. He celebrated with the stoning of Stephen. Only to be confronted by the living Christ. And when he stood confronted, he understood something really clear. I've been doing the wrong thing. And the God of all creation and his Messiah have picked me to bring that message to the Gentiles and I will do it with my whole life. How about you? You see yourself. How do you see yourself? Are we just on this mission of life where we're just trying to just survive and move along and, and just, you know, do life? Or maybe is there a possibility you could think that maybe doing life might be something that God says, I want you to do life with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that gives you such a boldness that you're prepared to speak instantly upon the directives of the Holy Spirit of God himself. And you're willing to yield your vocal cords to say anything else. You know what the the largest thing that God has done in my life over the years, you know what the largest thing that God has done in my life is yielded my tongue. Is to yield my tongue from the folly that comes out of a human heart, the stupidity that comes out of our mouth, the justification of circumstance. I just want to say this. I just want to say this. I just want to say this. When I say, oh God, help me to be who you've called me to be. Help me to capitalize on the moment that I'm on the ship and all of hell is breaking loose. Hurricane storms are here and I, I don't know what to do. And instead of saying something stupid that hinders the, the redemption of somebody else that's the witnesses looking on, God, help me to yield my tongue. Help me to turn my ear to your Holy Spirit and help the next thing that comes out of my mouth direct them to the foot of the cross. We can do that. We can do that. But it starts with us having an understanding of what it is to have the anchor for your soul. Do you hear me? Because that's the game changer. Because everything, everything changes when you realize that he's eternally secured us. Nothing can take us away from from him. Nothing. And then he, he looks at this world. The people around us. And the love of God pleads with us to say, listen, I've redeemed you and now I give you an opportunity to board that ship. To board that ship with a mission on your heart. To board that ship and say, I'm not looking for the most comfortable seat. God, I'll be happy to have a plank to float back to the shoreline after the mission is done. God, I want to be exactly who you've called me to be, and I know that my my journey needs to be guided by your Holy Spirit. And I need to have a willingness that says the only mission that matters is God's mission. And how do I do that? Well, I have to come to the point that I say that I have this hope as an anchor for my soul. I have to know Jesus paid it for me. I have to know that God loved me so much that he sent Jesus to do that, right? And I have to know that God's love for this world is an extension that's lived through our lives. And so if I get that, if I get that, and I get my mind off the temporal things because 
I don't know if you guys notice it. I, I go back to the same kind of thinking on a regular basis. Our sand clock of life, I don't care where you are, you know, once it's tipped over, I, I, I just posted something the other day somebody sent me, and it, it was talking about, you understand, you are in a line right now. You're in a line right now for eternity. And we don't know where you are in it, but God does. Right? And so when you think about, let's throw that into the mix. And then think about this. In the here and now, in the time that we have to accomplish the purposes of God, how about we get our minds in the game? And we say, God Almighty loved us so much that he sent Jesus because he is a just God. He would not leave son, sin un, unpunished. So Jesus came and paid the penalty. And he loved the world so much that he said, listen, don't get your eyes focused on everything that's going on here. Use what's going on here to reach those who don't know the love of God. And oh, by the way, you might end up on a crazy ship that's getting knocked the snot out of it. And you... And you're going to have to get on top of your mind when you start thinking, God, why don't you just calm this storm down? He says, because I created it. Do you hear me? I created it. Now look for what I'm doing. Look around. Consider what God might want to do in your life. Amen? I don't know where you're at. Tonight I was getting ready for this, this message here. I've got some other scriptures that I'm, I'm just not even going there. Because right now you've got enough on your plate to consider. To consider what it is to say to, to God, I want you to use me in whatever way you see fit. But I also want the boldness that comes from my identity that is found in Christ. I want to quit trying to be something else. I want to quit trying to accomplish things that you didn't call me to come. Scrap it all. God, I want to be on mission to accomplish what... I want to hear somebody say something that's this crazy. You could have walked free if you didn't appeal to Caesar. Now you're going over there and you're getting on that crazy ship. God says, awesome. Wear it well. Amen? Where do you find yourself tonight? You find yourself are you are you on a journey where you're just in here kind of investigating trying to figure out who god is let me tell you he's a loving god but he's not going to roll out a red carpet for you he's not going to pamper your bottom he's just not he's already done everything that was required to show his love illuminated beyond anything you can imagine and it happened on a cross when his son died on it for us and when we receive that love by way of asking him for forgiveness that's found through the blood of his son. The Bible says that we're grafted into the vine, we become children of God. Then that love is expressed as we receive, we become a co-heir with Christ. We're no longer on the outside, we're family. Then he says, now go out there and use your life to bring the rest in. He says, oh, by the way, the storm's going to get crazy. Amen? Are you interested? Are you guys interested? Jake, why don't you come on up? I don't know what you got planned for the, the tail end of this, but we always give an invitation, and an invitation really is an opportunity. And let me just tell you something. When I think about the journey of life and Christians that I talk to, and I talk to a lot of them that have issues going on in their life that are very real, and the problem that they have is a lot of times they're trying to find, they're trying to find the promenade deck on this boat. We've never been promised that. In fact, the reality of it is that God wants to do something with your life that you would really just get to the place to say, I want to have the confidence that comes from knowing who I am in Christ. And I want the boldness to say what I need to say with whatever company in order that it can meet somebody's ears. It's not easy to be a witness, a testimony for Jesus. It's not. Because it requires us to put lesser value in our time here and greater value in eternity. 
It requires us to understand that God has done something for us that we could not do for ourselves, and he's called us to be his ambassadors to reach others. There's storms involved with that, folks, and there's storms. And if we'll let him, he'll navigate our journey. So when we're in the middle of one of those, you'll know that he has control of all of it. And we find an opportunity to accomplish his very purpose. So I don't know if you've ever come to a place that you've called upon the name of the Lord, that you said, I need what Jesus did on that cross to count for me. If you've never done that, then you're on the outside of that relationship with God. Through the blood of his son, you need to come on up here. We'll pray with you. Counselors, why don't you come up here? You need to do that. Don't walk out the door and not know that you're, you have an anchor for your soul. Amen? But if you have, and you're in the middle of some crazy circumstance of life, and it seems like all I'm on is, is crazy ships that are breaking apart in hurricane winds, then, then the first thing I say is make sure that the ships that you're riding on are a direct result of standing in the boldness that it is of walking in your faith. If maybe you're on a different one. Maybe you come on in, come on up here. We'll pray about that. But if you're on a mission and you know that you're walking as a light, salt and light that you're called to be, and there's a hurricane wind tearing your life apart right now, let me just tell you, God's probably got you on display. Wear it well. If you don't know how to do that, why don't you come up? We'll pray about that as well. As the music plays, would you come?
Father God, we come before you and we thank you for this evening. God, we thank you for the opportunities that you give us. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for the opportunity, God, that you've allowed us to be say, Abba, Father, because of what Jesus has done. God, I pray that you would show us uh, how we might weather a storm when the circumstances look crazy, that we wouldn't look for the easy way out. We wouldn't look for, God, just how do we get away from this instead? God, that we might have a word that would be so inspired by you that it would move others. God, I pray for your power to be lived and experienced in its completeness. Help us not to resist you, Lord. Pray that you receive the glory from the attitudes of our heart, the actions that follow. We ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.